Okay, so we're here in my office, um, and I'm going to do the Wednesday night study. I started last week talking about the covenants of God, and I want to uh, continue with that and hopefully complete it uh, today, if I can, because um, next week we'll be moving into Holy Week, and I have some other things planned uh, for those nights between Palm Sunday and Easter, and I'll explain that uh, at a different time. So if this video goes a little longer, it's because I'm trying to complete this discussion on covenants. So last week, um, we discussed uh, the aspects of the Adamic covenant and how uh, man trying to do the right thing uh, didn't end well for Adam and Eve, that they, they broke the covenant they had with God. They disobeyed his commands, and, and something else had to happen. And, and it was at that point that I said, you know, but God had a different plan. And it's that different plan that I want to talk about uh, today, uh, which I, I find exciting uh, and, and, you know, however, you know, it should be noted that I'm a geek and I find a lot of things exciting that other people aren't particularly interested in. But uh, I want to talk about this other plan. God already had a different plan in mind. And, and I believe that God had this plan in mind before the Adamic covenant. And, and we'll see scripture to support that. And, and we get inklings of this plan and we know. It's ultimately a plan of redemption. And I'll be speaking more about that covenant a little later on. But to see it, and the first scripture we look at is, is here in Genesis 3.15. And, and it's the seed of the woman uh, statement that, that God makes uh, to Eve, or excuse me, to the serpent. When, when uh, they say the serpent deceived us. And I just want to read that, and I'm using God's Word translation. And it says, I will make you and the woman hostile towards each other. I will make your descendants and her descendants hostile towards each other. He will crush your head, and you will bruise his heel. And, and it's, it's generally agreed upon that what we see, and I believe this, that what we see in this scripture in, in, in Genesis 3.15 is, is that promise of the Lord. The, um, what we, we call you know the, the seed of the woman promise. And when he says the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent, we see in that Jesus that the new Adam uh, will, will win the battle against sin. And uh, so that's the first glimpse of, of something uh, we see that God had a different plan in mind. That God in that moment even had a redemptive plan in mind. And I believe God always has a redemptive plan in mind because it's part of his nature to be redemptive. Uh, not to be permissive or, or oblivious, but to be redemptive and um, you know, I see that in, in so much of what God does. And, and so we see that. Now, if we look at the next scripture, we really begin to see this come into place. And in fact, I think, you know, I was thinking, uh, if you'll just permit me a minute, uh, when I think about God being redemptive, he was uh, being redemptive when he came into the garden and called out Adam's name. And uh, the Lord already knew what Adam and Eve had done. And Adam and Eve sinned, and, and, and they hear the sound of God walking in the garden, and, and uh, they, they run and hide, uh, you know, which is what people do with the shame of sin. They hide it. And, and God calls them, you know, and... and Adam and says, you know, hey, we were ashamed and afraid because we were naked. And, and of course, God asked that question, you know, how did, how did you know you were naked? Did you eat of the fruit? Well, see, God knew all that before that conversation. He was just bringing Adam to a point of confession 
Because without confession, it's hard to get to redemption. As long as people hide sin, they can't be forgiven of sin. As long as they cover it up, they don't come to this place of confession with the Lord that leads down the redemptive path. So we want to see that there's a grace and mercy and redemption in so much of what God does from, from creation even till now. And, and remembering that what, what man or even Satan means for evil, God always intends for good because he knows the plans he makes for us. And so we see that. Now the next scripture we want to look at is, is 1 Peter 1.20. And, and if I can read that to you, it, it notes that he is the lamb, speaking of Jesus, he is the lamb who was known long ago before the world existed but for your good, he became publicly known in the last period of time. Now, now, the significance of this statement that Peter makes is that he's the lamb that was known long before the world existed. And, and that tells us if the lamb was known long before the world existed, then God had a redemptive plan before Adam and Eve were created, which means God had a redemptive plan before Adam and Eve sinned. That God had a redemptive plan when the commandment was given, do not eat the forbidden fruit. And, and that's, that's significant theologically to us. And, and if you'll, you'll, you'll allow me to, um, to explain it in in Greek for a minute it uses this this phrase and I'll write it on the board in just a moment pros katabales cosmu and um, so if we look at this uh, and I'll write it in English also pros katabales cosmu And, and so in English, that would, um, I'll use a different color for the English. In English, it would be P-R-O-S-K-A-T-A-B-O-L-E-S uh, is good enough, katabales. It's not always easy transliterating from one language to the next. And then Cosmu would be K O S M O. You Cosmo, and the, that means from that means before the foundations of the world. So uh, <clears throat> before, well, let's see. We'll erase the Greek because we don't need that. Um, so you get that pros katabolis Cosmo. So if I come up here. Um, <clears throat> from before and that's our um, boy I can't spell in English can I from before and that's the word uh, the concept in the pros right from before the creation or the world or the foundation really from before the foundation of the world now that's significant um, in fact we find this, um, I, 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 several times in the New Testament, and there's a distinction made between the two passages that I, I'm going to be looking at. And, and so I think uh, the, the phrase pros katabales cosmu is in the New Testament six times. And the next one I want to talk about, of course, was a pa katabales cosmu, and that's in the New Testament three times. And and, and they're distinctive statements. And, and so we learn from that. And so what we see is the, the lamb, the sacrificial lamb of God, was known from before the foundations of the earth, before the earth was without form and void, before even the spirit of the Lord was hovering over the earth, the lamb, that was to be slain was known. It was known that Jesus would be slain for our sins. And 
and that shows us that that God had a a pre-sin redemptive plan for man which is amazing that before man sinned God had a redemptive plan for him and why not because God is is omniscient is the word um, in theology which is just a fancy word that means all-knowing there there's no knowledge God doesn't already have and so if we look at this next scripture uh, and, and we, we see Revelation 13, 8 here. And, and I'd like to read that. And, and it's speaking about um, those who might bow and worship the image of the beast. But, but there's something we see about people whose names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life and, and different things. And I, I want to notice that. Um, and all those dwelling in the earth will worship it. Those of whom the names had not been written in the Book of Life of the Lamb having been slain from the foundation of the world. Now there's another passage that talks about when our names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and I'm not interested in dealing with that right now. As I said, I'll deal with some of these in more detail later at another time, uh, probably after Holy Week. And But, but this uh, from the foundation of the earth, not from before the foundation of the earth, but from the foundation of the earth. And notice what it identifies. The lamb having been slain from the foundation of the earth. So it was known that the lamb would be slain from before the foundation of the earth. And from the foundation of the earth, there, there's this slain of the lamb that occurs. Although we know here in, in real time to us, it happened in the first century uh, when Jesus died on a cross. But... In God's perspective, who stands outside of space and time, it was happening at the creation, at the founding of, of mankind. Uh, all this tells us he had an ongoing knowledge. And, and so if we put that up there, um, we, instead of proskatabolis, we have this word apa. And, and again, the Catabales. Oh, now I'm writing. Uh, and get my languages confused. And then uh, Cosmo. So that would be from the Greek text. And we have uh, a pod catabales. So you see here. The significance is this word, a paw, which we would spell in English, a paw, A-P-O, and it means from. And not from before, but from. And, and that's the significance of those differences in the text. Now, some people say, oh, it's the same thing. Well, I see it differently uh, because it means different things. And, and I want to get into that, like I said, after Holy Week, I'll break down the different uses of these two phrases. And, uh, and, and I find that uh, a fascinating study. But uh, in, in, in any of this, we see that it reminds us that everything has always meant to look to the cross. That, that when we think that uh, the Lamb that was to be slain was known from before the foundation of the earth and that the lamb was slain from the foundation of the earth the beginning of creation you know uh, in truth Adam and Eve slew the lamb the minute they sinned and that's the nature of sin that um, Jesus became sin on the cross for us that if Adam and Eve hadn't been the ones and it lasted until one of us, the minute we sinned, we would have slain the lamb. And in essence, we've all slain the lamb. Um, we've all crucified Christ. And we get that because when we look at that passage from Hebrews, you know, if you, someone apostatizes, which was a study we had on Wednesday nights before the the ban on groups meeting together because of the coronavirus we we saw that um, 
if someone walks away and apostates from the faith and comes back and tries to repent, they're crucifying Christ all over again. And, and so we, I, we begin to realize that uh, the crucifiers of Christ, they weren't just the Roman soldiers or the, the Jewish hierarchy that wanted to make this happen. They weren't just Adam and Eve. We're all, we're all crucifiers of Christ. And uh, it's our sin that does it. But, but God always had a plan. And it was always redemptive. And, and it reminds us everything is always looked forward to the cross. So if I can just erase this for a minute. I don't want to erase the brown because there's something I want to look at there. But if we look at things in, in terms of a, a timeline, just um, and I mean literally a line, not just uh, that goes infinitely in either direction infinitely in either direction sorry about that I was standing infinitely in either direction uh, we could say okay here's creation and we could say here's the cross of Christ the crucifixion but down here we could say here's the second coming of Christ and you notice that the time goes on before creation and the time goes on after the second coming um, because the, the lamb was known from before the creation of the world and will always be known but the so time goes this way but but in reality according to to the effects of the cross everything looks to the cross from either direction it all looks to what Jesus did. And, and that's important. That uh, the, all of the Old Testament look forward to the Messiah. And we all, in essence, look back to the Messiah, knowing he will come again and all of that. But, but we all look to this event for redemption. And that was always plan A. That was always God's original plan for man, was redemption. And, and we know that because the Lamb was known from before the foundations of the earth. And, and, and that brings us to this, this area in brown. God has always known this truth. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, which says this. God saved you through faith as an act of kindness. You had nothing to do with it. Being saved is a gift from God. It's not the result of anything you've done, so no one can brag about it. I, I think that's beautiful because we, we, we confuse the aspects of grace and salvation. We, we too often read this passage that God saved you through an act of faith as an act of kindness, or, or the word in Greek is charos, and people will say that as grace, and um, that God saved you that way. But we only look back to the cross. We don't remember that it also God had done that and knew that was true for Adam and Eve. That, that Adam and Eve were also saved by faith as an act of kindness of God all because of the cross because the lamb was known from before the foundation of the earth and slain from the foundation of the earth that abraham you know uh, jesus said it abraham longed to see my day and did and before abraham was i am he says he's identifying himself as the almighty there and and moses looked forward to to the messiah everyone looking to the cross uh, because the truth is that God's plan has always been that mankind would be saved not of works, but of grace as an act of kindness, not of or as of faith as an act of grace or kindness. And that's always been God's plan. And that's still what's happening. Now there are people in this world that are always trying to earn salvation and they they're trying to live out the Adamic covenant in their lives, thinking that will make the big difference. But God's plan, even for Adam, was was not that he'd be saved by the Adamic covenant, but that he'd be saved 
through faith as an act of grace, just as God had always planned, because the Lamb was known from before the foundations of the earth and was slain from the foundations of the earth. And so that brings us to this. To, to, to another aspect so that's got, kind of God had another plan besides the Adamic covenant but we can ask this question uh, do aspects of the Adamic covenant still exist you know was the Adamic covenant abolished or still is it still in effect and all that you know everything that God proclaims exists God doesn't change he's not fickle nothing falls apart so so there are going to be aspects of the Adamic covenant that continue and so we can just look at a couple continuing aspects of the Adamic Covenant. Uh, if we look at Galatians 3.12, we see here that law, it says this, Laws have nothing to do with faith, but whoever obeys laws will live because of the laws he obeys. So we see here that obedience is, uh, the, the, the obedience that was part of the Adamic, Adamic Covenant is still important today and and if anyone were to completely obey the law he could live and that's where you could say you know if this was a play enter Jesus because Jesus obeyed the law to perfection he did what no one could do and and, and on behalf of us all and, and which we've established as the original plan. And so if we look at Romans 6.26, we also see here, uh, it, it, you know, the payment of sin is death, but the gift that God freely gives is everlasting life found in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so the wages of sin is still death. The wages of sin is still death, just like it was with the Adamic Covenant. That when, when God said, when you eat the forbidden fruit, you shall die. You still die when you eat the forbidden fruit. That's what sin is. It's death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. That was also part of the, everything in the beginning with Adam and Eve. Even though it hadn't happened in our time yet, it had happened according to God. From the foundations of the earth, the lamb was slain. So salvation was still in Jesus, even though Jesus hadn't come to earth and died on the cross. And they understood that. And the animal sacrifice and all those things point to that. That's why a lamb without blemish was, was a sacrificial offering for sin and all those kinds of things. Now... What we do know also as we look at this, history implies a need for Christ. That's important. History implies a need for Christ. That um, we know that there's only been one Messiah. From Adam to the Messiah has been more than enough time to establish our need for forgiveness. And so that's an interesting thing. If we look at, at Jesus as the Messiah, and from from Adam, you know, from the creation until that day on the cross, thousands of years is enough historical evidence to tell us that man cannot redeem himself. It's enough to tell us man cannot be his sa own savior. It's enough to tell us man did not obey the law. And, and that's, the, that's the big story of the Old Testament. It's a unique aspect when you look at the Hebrew history of the Old Testament and their history of their kings particularly. Uh, they stand out in antiquities in the, in the Fertile Crescent area in the, in the Middle East, in the Central Asia part of the world where um, they, uh, other kings, when their chronicles and histories were written, uh, their 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 dirt was never told. They they didn't air their dirty laundry. They they only told about their great successes and how powerful and wonderful they were. But the chronicles of the Hebrews, the Israelites, tells the dark secrets of the kings and shows us whether they were sinful or good. And 
part of the importance of that is that the Old Testament is a faithful history telling us that, that man has never been able to redeem himself. Man has never been able to live the law with perfection. We look at David, a man after his own heart, you know, and, and, and there's no one like David, a man after God's heart, who, and, and the, he says, and then the Lord says, you know, he's done everything so well, except, you know, that thing with Bathsheba. You know, that little thing where he sleeps with another man's wife, gets her pregnant, tries to cover it up, and then can't, so he commits murder. Um, that little thing. See, that's grace. That's redemption. Not in the behavior of David. Not in the Psalms of David. Not in, in, in the conquering of David. Not in him even pursuing God. See, David never pursued any other God but God. That was the good thing that he did. But the redeeming thing was not of works, lest any man should boast, but faith in Christ Jesus, looking forward to the Messiah. It's always been the same. Uh, it's in Jesus. And, and so we, we see those things. So Jesus came. You know, there's this whole history that man needed a Savior because man couldn't do it. Even Abraham, right, the patriarch of, of the people, uh, lied. Moses committed murder. Uh, you know, down through the process, there's... The, Nobody's sparkly white, and, and so Jesus comes, and he is. And there's redemption because he gives himself to the cross for us. And, and history since the day of the cross, history since Jesus' sacrifice also, proves to us that man cannot redeem himself. People fail, and we need redemption. And so the wages of sin continue to be death. And it reminds me of this scripture um, I didn't write on here, Galatians 3.10. So I could just put that here real quickly. Um, Galatians 3.10. And, and let me just read that. It says, uh, Certainly... There is a curse on all who rely on their own efforts to live according to a set of standards because scripture says whoever doesn't obey everything that is written in Moses' teachings is cursed. Now think about that as a Christian relying on the redemptive favor of the Lord. That there's a curse on anyone who tries to be his own redeemer. There's a curse on anyone who tries to be such a good Christian without needing the redemptive kindness of Jesus Christ and, and, and leaning on that sacrifice because you can't do it. When you look at yourself and you see your failures, you have to remember, you can't do it. You must be saved by faith. And those people that are under your skin, those people that are such a problem and and I get it we all have those people in our lives that that they're they're they're, they're always going back to the mud wallowing God knew it and the redemptive plan was made for them too the redemptive power of Jesus over their lives I mean I've wallowed in my own mud in my life as a Christian you know, and we've prayed those prayers as Christians. Lord, I won't ever do that again. I don't want to fall prey to that. I won't ever lose my temper again. I won't do this. I won't do that. Whatever it is for you. And we come back to one thing. Salvation is by faith, not of works, lest any man can boast. And, and boasting about your spirituality is dangerous, dangerous business. I, I wouldn't want to figure out how to live without a Savior. Because I love my Savior and I like him in my life. So um, that, that sums up uh, what we can ascertain largely about um, the, Adamic, the Adamic covenant.